Hi, Philosophy 103. Um, this is section test two I hold in my hands. i um, recording this video to um, go over the questions, make sure you're on the same page. Um, note also the distinction in the um, due date for this. It's November 3rd by 12 p.m. It was initially on the syllabus November 1st, but um, it's I'm not going to have a chance to get to them till the 3rd anyway, so um, that'll be the deal. Um, so it, it, most of the, the, the first page here is just sort of boilerplate for you, um, taken from the course syllabus section tests. Well, you know what they are. There are three of them. They're, um, they're divided into two sections each. Uh, their short answer questions were two each for a total of ten, so five of them. Um, and one longer answer question worth um, ten points where you enter into an argument. So um, everything that we do in the class is just fair game. The readings, the videos, and um, the, the, the video lectures, lectures. Um, and um, anyhow, um, you're submitting your responses to Moodle, blah, 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 blah. All right, you've already been through one of these, so um, you know what's going on. Now, uh, the missed assignment policy, um, the deal is here, either let me know if you're going to miss this assignment before the deadline or due date, um, or within 12 hours of it. Oh, that way I'll be able to work with you to uh, get you an extension if you need one. You know, um, few of you, many of you know that I'm very forthcoming with extensions um, if need be, but you just have to have a conversation with me. Otherwise, people are just turning things in whenever they want and deadlines make no sense, right? So um, it, it, that's not fair to me. It's not fair to other students in the class. It's not fair to you because everything bunches up at the end and um, you wind up with too much work and don't complete it. So um, anyhow, that's the policy. Um, let me know either before the deadline or 12 hours of the deadline if you're going to miss with, uh, the deadline and we'll work with you. All right. Assignment submission, make sure I've got the right file, make sure it uploaded, make sure it uploaded correctly, make sure the right thing uploaded. Um, it's not my job to chase you for this. If I don't have it, I don't have it. Um, if you're really nervous, email it as well. Um, that way I have it not just one way, but two ways. All right. Um, and in terms of plagiarism, don't, don't do it. If you're using sources, other than your own reflections, cite them, right? You must do this. Otherwise, um, you're in violation of OU policy, you're in violation of my policy, and since this is um, a can't mill exam, here's a fun thing. Um, eh, it's okay to plagiarize, universe, isolate that maxim, and universalize it, right? The funny thing is, if you tried to will the maxim it, 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 you should plagiarize as a universal law it would refute itself because then there would be nothing to plagiarize so in Kantian terms right it's a violation of a perfect duty to plagiarize right what about in terms of Mill he's the benefit guy the consequences guy well I've spelled out quite clearly in the syllabus um, what the consequences on my end and what Oakland University's end are. Now you do the cost-benefit analysis and if you want to fail the course, that's the way you, you fail the course, right? So in terms of the theory that we're discussing, don't do it, right? Um, it, it, I say that in the nicest, friendliest kind of way. So readings, Kant grounding to the metaphysic of morals, um, which is bugger over here and the other one is John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism and do, 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 on liberty here are the rest of my books and it's partially the good thing about doing this at home I've got everything right here right so those are your books um, those are the sections I've, I've listed here um, uh, Kant grounding to the metaphysic of morals, section one and two, mill utilitarianism, one, two, and three, and mill on liberties, just section one. Um, that's that's the textual material. Video material, um, your response, it's, uh, it's all on Moodle. Um, there's stuff from me, there's stuff from Sandell, there's stuff from uh, Rick Roderick. Um, there's actually a lot of video material that I refer to um, in uh, at least one of the questions here. Right. Um, 
plus those are really great introductions to this material. So, part one, short answer questions. Um, I, I did three on Kant and then two on Mill. Right. And I've got the wrong question printed out on Mill. That's fun. Um, so, uh, what I will do is just print a um, copy of this. Well, we are talking here. Um, who print print now? Well, that chugs away. Um, we will start in because I did change the last question to something more interesting. Um, so, question one: Kant argues in the preface to the grounding that a metaphysics of morals is necessary since what it is to be morally good that it conforms with the moral law is not enough. Why does Kant argue this? Right. Um, it, when I introduce this material, I give you the example of the uh, big check um, that um, I got or that, that, that I saw on my shift in the library at the University of Windsor. Um, I give you lots of examples of this, in fact, right? That things conform with the moral law, according to Kant, is not enough. It must, uh, the action must be done for the sake of the moral law. Now, both Sandel and Roderick actually go to a great deal of effort to explain this to you, as have I. Um, so hopefully this first question should be um, straightforward. Um, largely, what Kant wants to argue is that conformity of the moral law on the basis of a non-moral principle for doing the right thing, not for the right reasons, but for some sort of contingent reasons, sometimes results in a morally good action. But if you want to be sure people are doing the right thing for the right reasons, you've got to, the right thing all the time, you've got to make sure that they're acting on the right principle. Right? This is why a metaphysic of morals is indispensably necessary, he argues. Um, that's, that's page three. Number two, in his discussion of the first formulation of the categorical imperative, which I then quote for you, act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will, not wills, will, uh, that it should become a universal moral law. Right? Kant draws a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. Introduce this, uh, the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. Right. Now, in terms of uh, this first formulation of the categorical imperative, there's a mechanism that I'm looking for here. I mean, um, it's, it's one thing uh, to say that perfect duties have a stronger moral obligation and imperfect duties have a weaker form of moral obligation. That's one thing, but that's not the complete argument, right? Um, it, largely, reason suggests perfect duties and the will suggests imperfect duties. There's a mechanism within the formulation of the categorical imperative right, that you can follow through in the footnotes as Kant's discussing those four cases um, as he builds that case. The translator introduces that distinction. Not Kant, but really that's what Kant is trying to do is introduce that. He's just not always clear. right? Um, I introduce it um, in my material, so you should be on fairly solid ground for that. If not, email me. Question number three. The humanity principle um, acts in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, always as an end in itself and never merely as a means. As another formulation of the categorical imperative, this principle, he argues, rests on the dignity of human beings. He argues Human beings are objects of respect. That's page 36. Why are human beings, according to Kant, objects of respect? Why are people valuable? And a hint would be for this question to take a good long look at uh, Sandel's treatment of Kant's notion of freedom right, as autonomy, as distinct from heteronomy. Right. Um, I do that in my video material as well. So um, that's, that's the answer to that question. So I guess I just gave it to you. Anyhow, um, it's why well, it's good to watch the video. I give you too much. Right. 
Now, question number four. Mill modifies Bentham's initial position in two main respects regarding the principle of utility. We should calculate the greatest good for the greatest number. Right. And the greatest good, Mill argues, should be, um, it, it, well, it, the greatest good, according to both Bentham and Mill, is determined in terms of pleasure and pain. Pleasure and pain are Ershofer and Masters. That's that passage from Bentham. Um, Mill echoes that, but wants to add a distinction. And the distinction that Mill wants to add is that um, to his greatest happiness principle and happy, happiness is whatever promotes pain or, uh, you know, avoids the reverse of or a pleasure, that is, and whatever avoids the reverse of pleasure, namely suffering or pain, right? So, right, pleasure and pain are a sovereign masters. We like pleasure. We don't like pain. Whatever enhances pleasure, well, lessening pain is what is morally good, right? So craft an action that'll do that, right? So in the first respect that Mill alters, right, um, at Bentham's position, right, Mill finds it necessary to make a distinction between quantitative and qualitative analysis of pleasures. I've been calling this lately higher order and lower order pleasures, right? Discuss the principle of utility generally, right? So introduce the principle of utility. What's that all about, right? And explain this distinction, discussing why Mill argues that it's a necessary addition to utilitarian morality. Now, I will point out that there are two ways to do this, right? Um, to to argue that it is an, a necessary addition to utilitarian morality, right? One is to um, follow Sandel's argument. Right, for uh, why we need to make the distinction. Right, Sandel lays it out very, very clearly. I think I do a bit of that as well. Um, in order to overcome an objection to utility, right, then what we need to do is add this distinction. Right, Mill himself actually makes. Do, 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 do an argument about the expression of human capacities. That's another track that you could take for that part of the question. So, two things you're doing. Principle of utility and why would Mill argue that this would be a necessary addition to utilitarian morality. It does two things, so give me one of the two. Alright. Alrighty. Question five. I just composed this one, so we'll see how I did. Mill introduces the notion of political liberty and his on liberty to dis address a specific criticism of the principle of utility related to human individual human rights, which was introduced by Michael Sandel, Justice, Episode 2, posted to Moodle. Introdu introduce the notion of political liberty advanced by Mill. You will find his case for liberty in, of course, on liberty. Right? Um, it introduced the notion of political liberty advanced by Mill and discuss how this notion might respond to the criticism introduced by Sandel. Two points. Okay. So that's an aspect where you are responsible for a video right, in terms of addressing a position from a video. Right. So political liberty is largely that it's he he tells you what political liberty in the sense that he's talking about um, in the introductory section um, um, on page five, right? And with regard to the principle that he is adding as an addition, as uh, his, his, as he puts it on page five, um, a, a, a practical limit, right? Um, but though this proposition is not likely to be contested in general terms, the practical question here is where to place the limit, how to make a fitting adjustment between individual independence and social control is sub a subject on which uh, nearly everything remains to be done. Well, he did a lot of it right here. Now, um, now page nine, 
he, he, he tells you flat out, the object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely in the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means be used be physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. That principle is that dot dot dot, right? So those are the relevant passages. Um, that's where you're looking. Right. I had to go a whopping, what, 10 pages into On Liberty for this argument um, to respond to this question. So um, those are the short answer questions. Now, on to the longer answer question. Um, just to be super clear on this, um, these longer answer questions require between three and five paragraphs in response. So that's minimally three paragraphs. If I don't have three paragraphs, I don't have a complete response. And if I don't have a complete response, you can't pass, right? It cannot receive a passing grade if you don't meet the minimum. That's just why there are minimums. And a paragraph consists of a minimum of three sentences. That's just the definition for a paragraph. If you don't have three sentences, you don't have a paragraph. The goal of this section is to make a short argumentative account of the material at hand as directed by the question below. For an argumentative account, you have to take a position and argue it, right? So, now I start off by quoting um, utilitarianism on page four, and this is Mill's critique of um, Kant, right? His very general critique and you know, fairly biting critique of Kant uh, in, 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 in Kantian morality. Um, so in his utilitarianism, Mill argues, this remarkable man, Kant, whose system of thought will long remain one of the landmarks in the history of philosophical speculation, does, in the treatise in question, lay down a universal first principle as to, uh, as to the origin and ground of moral obligation. It is this, and he paraphrases Kant in sort of a weird way. So act that the rule on which thou actest would admit of being adopted as a law by all rational beings. Uh, the translation we're working with is a bit better than Mill's, but nonetheless, same idea. Right? But when he begins to deduce from this precept any of the actual duties of morality, he fails almost grotesquely to show that there would be any contradiction, any logical, not to say physical, impossibility in the adoption by all rational beings of the most outrageously immoral rules of conduct. All he shows is that the consequences of their universal adoption would be such as no one would choose to incur. That's page four of utilitarianism. So the, Kant, the criticism Mill is making of Kant here is that when we actually try to apply the first formulation of the, the, the categorical imperative, we, and even Kant when he does so, falls back on consequences. Right. Now, it's if we go to Immanuel Kant and um, the footnote in the first section when he is first introducing right, um, the, 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 on page 15, the first formulation of the categorical imperative with regard to the false promise, right? The footnote, which is number 16, reads, this means that when you tell a lie, you merely take an exception to the general rule that says everyone should always tell the truth and believe what you are saying is true. When you lie, you do not thereby will that everyone else lie and not believe what you are saying is true, because in such a case, your lie would never work and you wouldn't get what you want. Sounds like consequences to me, right? I'll read that part of the sentence, because in such a case, your lie would never work and you would not get what you want, right? Now, it seems right that this is a biting criticism of Kant right so I continue in the question this uh, 
criticism would seem to cut to the core since uh, the moral system offered by Kant insists that the motive of the action, uh, that it is the motive of the action that determines the moral worth of the action and not its consequences. Just to clarify there, uh, you know, as, as pointed out, oh geez, did I lose the cover? No, nope, it's still there. It, it's, it's pointed out in one of the previous questions, like the first short answer question here, which reads, Kant argues in the preface to the grounding that a metaphysic of morals is necessary since what it, uh, what it is to be morally good, that it conforms with the moral law is not enough. The end of that sentence is that it should be the action should be done for the sake of the moral law that's the right motive to act right you should be acting out of reverence for the moral law but if every time Kant tries to demonstrate or apply his first principle of morality he's evaluating consequences he's in violation of the very dictate of Kantian morality every time he uses the first principle of Kantian morality right it would seem to cut to the core of his moral system which holds that consequences have very little bearing on the morality of an action what makes an action moral is its motive and the only moral motive that there is is to act for the sake of of duty right now your task presenting an outline of both positions tell me what Kantian morality is tell me what utilitarian morality is and by outline I mean just really j rough gestured outline I should at the end of reading your response as a response as a discrete sort of active academic writing I should have a rough idea and on the basis of your response to this one question of what Kantian and utilitarian morality are so presenting an outline of both positions critically assess this criticism of Kant is this criticism fatal to Kantian morality or is there something to be said of Kantian morality over and against the principle of utility right. so even given this criticism is it possible to defend Kantian morality because utilitarian morality like is there a compatibility that 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 can be so basically right using this criticism and the outline of both Kantian and utilitarian morality as your basis enter into the consequentialist versus deontological debate right Kant's a deontologist uh, deontologist and Mill's a consequentialist right so um, that is uh, your task right um, so I look forward to reading your responses if you're not understanding what these questions are asking of you please contact me I answer emails we can Skype meet we can discuss this I can break these questions down so that they will make more sense to you if need be um, I don't know you're having a rough time if I don't know that you're having a rough time so I can't help unless you ask me for help so um, <clears throat> that will be the deal um, I've given you a little extra time on this 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 particular exam and um, I look forward to reading your responses have good days one for each of you